Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven verses nine and ten. Now I rejoice that not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Okay? Now, you know, I've heard some of the brethren, and they'll say, well, see this, in context, it's talking about Paul rebuking the Corinthians because they were messing around with sin. You know, they had this guy in the congregation that was having his father's wife, fornication, you know, really bad. And... You know, th this was bad, and so they repented of that. They were saved people repenting of the fact that they were allowing this fornicating pervert to be in their, in their congregation. So they're repenting from that. Now, that is true, but look at the thing, okay? Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. Have you ever met a real Christian that was really, truly sorry that they ever got saved? I never have. I've seen false converts, a lot of the Hiles Anderson people, you can find them here on YouTube. I talked about that in my study on Jack Hiles. You can find people here on YouTube that are like, oh, I was raised at First Baptist Church, and now I'm an atheist. Uh, I'm sorry, you were never truly converted. Okay, those people that turn and totally hate God, they were never truly converted. Okay? Godly sorrow, when you understand your sorrow is directed <clears throat> between you and your relationship to God. Yes, you might say, I've wronged that person, or I've wronged my parents, or I've wronged my friend, or I've wronged this or that, but you're really worried most about you and God, that relationship right there. That's godly sorrow. And that godly sorrow says, it works what? It works repentance right there to salvation, not to be repented of. You turn to God, and you might kind of get off course a little bit occasionally, and you might kind of mess around in sin and kind of get away from the Lord, and you might quit reading your Bible for a little bit. You might lose some, you know, fail at some times when you should have witnessed. You might do a little bit of this, but you're always going to be pointed in that direction towards God. You're not ever going to turn and go the opposite direction from God and just say, I hate God, I don't, you know, I'm an atheist now or something like that. I don't believe that that's a truly saved person. You say, well, Brian, you might be wrong. Well, I don't think I am. And, you know, again, I prefer to fail on the side of, of, of or to err, I should say, err on the side of caution. I'm not going to go around and just pronounce anybody that says, I'm a Christian. Well, praise the Lord, I'll see you in heaven. Ugh. You know? I want to be careful about that. But notice there in verse 10 it says, But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Okay. What does that mean? The sorrow of the world. You get some movie star. I, this, like you see it all the time on, this, on the internet. I get on to check my email or whatever. And this Michael Phelps guy, this uh, Olympic swimmer guy. And it's just like, yeah, you know, he got busted for drugs. And ended up for DUI. And then he got busted for drugs again. And. And, uh, yeah, he got drunk again, and, and uh, you know, what's he doing? And each time, oh, I'm sorry I let my fans down. I'm sorry for this, and I'm sorry for that. Why don't you turn from it? Well, you know, yeah, I'd like to, but he just keeps on with it. These Hollywood actors and things like this just, oh, I'm sorry I messed up. Oh, man, I, I've got to put, be put in drug rehab and stuff like this. They go right back to it again, you know. So... Back to their wallowing in the mire. See, that's godly, or that's a worldly sorrow. Okay, next go to Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 8. And look another example of repentance here. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 8. Okay. We have here, if that nation proceed. Uh, Excuse me, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Okay, now here's another one of the favorite tactics of the no repentance crowd. They say, the Bible says that God repents. So I guess that, according to the repentance preachers, that means that God's a sinner. 
Uh, no. Uh, you determine the meaning of the word repentance is determined by the context in which it appears. When it says, like right here, when it says, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Well, God's not doing anything wrong. God's not a sinner. What God is saying is, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to turn away from, my wrath is going to turn away from that nation. That's what's going on there. But look at the other part of the verse. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil. Okay? God says, you better straighten up. You better change. You better change direction. Are you going to turn from that evil? Are you going to repent? Except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish? No. I'm proud to be an American. The Lord looks down and says, Okay, then I'm not going to repent. You, as sinners, I'm telling you to repent, to turn from that sin. Okay, as a nation. Again, this is talking about national repentance here, not individual repentance. Now, I realize national you know, repentance is, you know, it's necessary that each individual repents. I understand that. But when you have national repentance, a nation turns away from the evil that they're doing. I mean, it's just be like, we'll say it this way. You get some guy, this isn't going to happen, but you get some Christian, Bible-believing guy, and he runs for presidency next time, and he gets into office. Obama's finally out of here, you know. And this Christian guy is now in office, and he says, I'm going to make abortion illegal. And I'm also going to make pornography illegal. And I'm going to make sodomite marriage illegal. And I'm going to, there will be no more sodomite parades. And there's going to be, you know, I'm going to have, I'm, I'm going to crack down on Hollywood. I'm going to crack down on the television industry. I'm going to do all this stuff. Kick the Jesuits out of the country and stuff like this. America go, could go back to being a very prosperous nation that God would bless. God would turn from the evil that he has pronounced against this nation right now. Is that going to happen? Not on your life. You know why? We're heading into Bible prophecy being fulfilled here. Okay. So, again, this verse is talking about a national repentance. And God is saying, if you repent from your sin, I will repent. I will turn, change my mind away from the wrath that I'm going to bring upon you. So, again, you see the, another definition there. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6. Again, you know, when you define things in Scripture, it's the context that you look at. So don't fall for this, this ridiculous, stupid lie that these easy believism heretics bring out and they say you know, about God repenting and stuff. Just look at the context. You'll see the definition of it in that context. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Now, you're going to see this thing of easy believism heretics are like, you know, this Bible, you know, these repentance people are like, turn from your sin. There's nothing in Scripture like that. Nowhere does it say that you're to turn from your sin. You just read it right there. Okay? I mean, look at that. Verse 6. Turn your, yourselves from your idols. Turn away your faces from all your abominations. Repent. See? Turn away from that stuff. You know? There has to be a changed life. That has to be part of it. Okay? Repentance is not the only part of the gospel. It's not you change and you turn, you turn away from all your sins and, and, you know, just change your whole life. And then you're saved. No, 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 no. Repentance is simply understanding, I'm a sinner. I can't do anything to save myself. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I put my faith in Him. And now, God, whatever you tell me to do from here on out, I'm going to live for you. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Doesn't mean you're always going to obey God. But you have a different life after you get genuinely born again. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according 
to his ways, saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Again, another perfect description of what repentance is. All right? When you repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Again, you people know what it is. How many of you out there were former alcoholics, former pornography addicts, former drug addicts, former whatever? And you realize this stuff is killing me. And you're like, I got to quit. This is bad. I, know, I But how do I quit? What am I supposed to do? The gospel is presented. You go, man, yeah, I am a sinner. And you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You come to him and you say, I'm, I'm a sinner. Please save me. And Jesus Christ saves you. You're born again. And now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can turn from that. Because, you see, if you don't, iniquity shall be your ruin. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. See, if you mess around with sin, sin will kill you. Again, people that don't understand eternal security, they say, well, then I can sin and just get away with it. You can't sin and get away with it. You know why? All sin is negative. Every single sin that you commit will destroy you in the end. It's like I talked about earlier. The, the, one of the neighbors here in the neighborhood, 56 years old, dead from cigarettes, lung cancer. And you know what the worst part? I heard that the doctor had told the guy two or three years ago, you better quit, stop, you better quit the cigarettes. It's killing you. He didn't quit. So a preacher says to the sinner out there, you better quit that sin. It's killing you. Don't tell me to quit. I can live however I want to live. Don't tell me how to live. Okay, you're going to die. And if you're lost, you're going to hell. Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. Go over there. Matthew 11 and verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Okay, and let's keep reading here. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Remember what Job said? I repent, I abhor myself and repent in sackcloth and ash. You know, in, or in dust and ash, I think it is. You know, what is that? What was Job? Totally broken, on the ground, totally financially ruined, Family's destroyed. Everything's falling apart. His health is failing him. Everything. Broken. Totally broken. No pride left. No dignity. No honor. No good name or anything. Down there in the dirt. See? And Jesus is saying, if I came back there in Tyre and Sidon, they would have seen what I was doing and they would have repented and been in sackcloth and ash. You know one of the good ways to turn God's wrath away from a country? Wouldn't it be something if the whole country just repented and just went out and said, you know what, I'm burning all the satanic Hollywood stuff, I'm burning all the pornography, you know, all the sodomites said we're repenting before God and everything else. It would take a massive repentance in this nation to turn away God's wrath. Okay? But these people repented not. Again, we see national repentance there. All right. Next, go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Matthew 12, verse 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. What did they do in Nineveh? There. They repented. They nationally repented. It wasn't individual repentance. That doesn't mean that everybody in Nineveh got saved. It's just they repented of the evil. Nationally, they repented. So God said, okay, you repented? So I'll repent of the evil that I was going to do to you. Doesn't make God a sinner. 
the people were the sinners. And God was saying, I'm going to do bad to you. Again, context defines the meaning of repentance. Right? Again, we're seeing here in verse 41, national repentance. Not individual, not for eternal salvation, but national repentance. But why is Jesus using this as an example? Okay? Why is he using it? He is using it simply because, you know, verse 38, Then certain of the scribes and the, of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would, should, or we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay? So he's saying, what happened to Job back then? Or what's, what, not Job, Jonah. What happened back there? You know, said Jonas here. You know, I'm going to die and I'm going to be buried three days and three nights and I'm going to come back from the dead. All right? That's your sign if you want one. All right? And it is quite a sign too. You know, I wasn't meaning it's not much of a sign. It's a very great sign that Jesus rose from the dead. All right? So, again, you see there another example of this thing of national repentance. And Jesus is trying to show by that national repentance that each individual there, you know, you can understand that, you know, you're a sinner and things and that Jesus Christ died and, and you know, he's prophesying his own death here. So, but let's go on to the next one here. Um, there's a bunch of scriptures here. I'm trying not to rabbit trail too much here. Trying to get through these. Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty-one. Second Corinthians twelve, verse twenty-one. Okay. And lest, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be where. Bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Now you can make the argument there that these people could be saved. And see again, repentance can happen after salvation as well. The Christian life is a life of repentance. You're going to sin, you're going to mess up after you are saved. But the idea is you keep turning from that. You keep confessing your sins you know, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1. So, you have to stay in fellowship with the Lord. Right? First, your sins, you repent of those sins, you know, meaning that you are no longer, your, your attitude towards your sins is now saying, you know, those sins aren't just no big deal anymore. No, they've got me in trouble with the Lord. So I need to come him, to him as a sinner. Okay, so that repentance starts out there, coming to God as a sinner, broken, contrite, saying, God, please save me. You know, you get saved, and now to stay in fellowship with the Lord, not to keep your salvation, okay, not to keep yourself saved, but to stay in fellowship, a right relationship with the Lord, and to preserve your life, too, you repent of those sins. And Paul is saying here, I believe he's talking to saved people, and he is saying there that you're messing around with uncleanness, fornication, lasciviousness, you know? You're messing around with that stuff. You better repent, you know? Unless you want God's judgment coming down upon you. Next, go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 29. Matthew 21. <clears throat> Matthew 21, verse 29. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. Talking about this thing of a certain man having two sons and going out into the vineyard. Okay, and he says to the first one, you know, I want you to do this. And the son says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he walks away and then he goes, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Okay, I will. And he goes and actually, you know, does right. You know, and of course, the point that's made here, she has in parentheses here, here he did change his mind plus started doing the work. 
Okay, now that's a good point. All right, it would have been one thing for him to say, "No, I'm not going to go into the vineyard to work," and then he turns around and says, "I guess later I will." Yeah, I, I okay, I, I will. I shouldn't have said that to my dad. I'll you know, okay, I'll go work, but then he doesn't go work. He didn't truly repent. See. So you get somebody that says, you know, I want to get saved and, and I'm a sinner and whatever else. And then they just go on living in their life of sin after their supposed conversion. Mm, uh, uh. That's kind of a problem. Next, go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 3. Okay. It says here, then Judas which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, and went and hanged himself. What did we read in Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10? The sorrow of the world worketh death. And I remember there was this country singer, Mindy McCready, and I said years and years and years ago, uh, I saw that she tried to commit suicide by overdosing on antidepressants. I thought, good advertisement there for antidepressants. You know, that's really helping you. You know, somebody tries to commit suicide. She's a big country singer, you know, and she tries to commit suicide by overdosing on antidepressants. It's just whatever. But, you know, she, she tried, and then she tried again, you know, and I said, in one of my sermons, I said, she's going to keep trying until she succeeds. Well, you know, a year or two ago, they found her at her boyfriend's cabin or something like this. And she had his dog there. She shot the dog and then she killed herself. Why? She was sorry for the life that she had. She was kind of like Judas Iscariot, you see. But notice there, it says, verse 3, he repented himself. Verse 4, I have sinned. What was the sin? See, he didn't sin and say, God, I'm a sinner. He went and, and tried to make things right there with the, the priests, the chief priests and the elders and things. He was worried about down here on the earth. See, he had worldly sorrow and it worked death for him. That's not true repentance. Okay? Okay. Next, we're going to go to Acts chapter 8, verse 22. Acts 8, verse 22. It says here, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Okay? And let's read context here, because this is important to get into context. Um, verse 18. Verse 18. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. Okay, and let me just stop there for a minute. Keep your place there in verse 19, but if you jump up to verse 13, it says, Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. Okay, so this guy had made a profession of faith. And later down here in verses 18 and 19, he's saying, I'd like to buy this Holy Ghost. Verse 20 says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because that thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Then he says, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. So what do you have? I believe Simon was a false convert. See, he was bewitching all these people and things. If you go up to verse 9 there in the chapter, you can see he's bewitching people. And he looks and he sees, wow, this, this, excuse me, microphone dropped there. He goes down and he says, wow, you know, this, uh, this Holy Ghost thing, this would make a really, really good show. You know, I could do much better, you know. And... You know, so he looks and he says, I wonder if I could purchase this with money. Because if I could, you know, and what's the point of purchasing the Holy Ghost with money? Because there'd be a good return on investment, you know. If he can go over and lay hands on people and stuff like this and heal people and things, you know. I mean, sure, 
you could make a lot of money. He wanted to put on his show. He could bewitch people even better if he had this special gift that the apostles had. See, so his heart was not right with God. He hadn't truly repented and come to God as a sinner. Okay. I think we already did Jeremiah 18, verse 8. I think we already covered that one. Yes. So she has it written twice here. Um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 is the next verse that's listed. Revelation 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Okay, now here again, we are talking about a believer restoring fellowship. Right, I don't believe that this one here, in context, I don't believe it's talking about repentance to salvation. It's talking about a church there, the church of uh, Ephesus, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. And they are messing around there. They're, um, uh, da, 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 da. Just trying to see what was the thing here. Uh, verse 3, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Okay, verse 4, nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Go back, in other words. And, and of course what it's talking about there in context is you have Christians that get saved, and they are witnessing, and they're reading the Bible, and praying, and they're very active in their relationship to the Lord. And then they start to fall by the wayside and go back to the world and get messed up in the world, you know. And the Lord's saying, stop and turn around and get out of that situation. So, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5 is talking about save people in fellowship, you know, restoring that fellowship. All right? Again, that, that one there, according to the context, it's not talking about salvation, lost person becoming saved. Let's continue. Revelation chapter 2, verse 21. Okay. Um, well, actually, we'll go up to verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast su or thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Okay, this is talking about a very wicked woman there, the, and I believe the spirit of Jezebel is the spirit that's in Roman Catholicism, that feministic, you know, controlling spirit there. And God has given her the space to repent, to stop, to turn from that. She doesn't repent. So God destroys Jezebel, and he will. God destroyed the Old Testament Jezebel, and he's going to destroy the New Testament, Revelation chapter 17 and 18, you know, Jezebel. Okay, Mystery Babylon, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. All right, Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. Okay, here you have in the time of Jacob's trouble, you have these people, I believe, that have taken the mark of the beast, you know, and they don't repent. They will not turn and say, boy, we were wrong, I'm sorry, you know, and things like that. They're not sorry for what they've done. All right. So here in this context, actually, you have people that are not repenting, that are lost, and, you know, if they have taken the mark of the beast, they can't repent. You know, they, I mean, they could say, I guess they could turn and say, well, you know, I was wrong for taking the mark of the beast, but whatever, you know. But these people here are not repenting. So another interesting use of the word repentance. Um, Revelation, okay, verse... Or, yeah, chapter 16, verse 11. Revelation chapter 16, verse 11. 
and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Okay, so, you know, uh, you go, jump up to verse 9 there. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So you have these lost people in the time of Jacob's trouble, and they're not repenting. You know, that can be national, it can be individual. They're, again, you know, they're not turning from their wickedness. And, of course, you know, it's kind of strange, actually, to look out there at society right now, and you can see a lot of these people, they don't care anything at all about the Bible or whatever. They're just so wicked. They're going to be the ones that are going to be, they're going to fulfill that scripture in the future because we are very close to the time of Jacob's trouble now. Um... Okay, here's another thing here she has written. Uh, to be mentioned that we cannot, can stop sinning only for a very short while, sometimes we cannot at all. Why, when we realize that by our own power we cannot stop sinning, as well as we cannot keep the commandments? At that point we realize that only God can help us, so we turn to Him. Very true. And it says, turn to God and Jesus from the opposite direction you were going, plus you changed your mind and view about who God is and that He exists. And then you believe the gospel there. Of course, that's very true. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Mark 1, verse 15 says, And saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. <clears throat> So it's kind of funny if you go with um, Jack Hiles' definition there, you know, um, that he says repentance is going from unbelief to belief. So you'd be saying, believe ye and believe the gospel. You know, um, no, it's uh, two different things there. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You say, well, then that, you know, you're teaching two different things. Well, it's two different things, but it happens at the same time. Like I've said in other studies. You know, you come to God as a sinner. Okay, you can't save yourself. And when you are real with God like that and you're saying, I'm here, I'm broken, I don't have any pride anymore, I repent, I abhor myself, you know, I know I'm sorry for what I am, you know, I'm sorry for what I've done, I'm, I'm sorry, please save me. You know, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe that's my only chance. Please save me. Okay? That's true salvation. So you see that here in this verse, Mark 1, 15. Uh, <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, verse 21, another very good verse that proves this thing. And you get all these, you get all these people, these false teachers and stuff, and they're just, they live so wickedly, they're just, they're so vile and everything. And yet they say, well, I've believed the gospel. I believe that Jesus is my Savior. It's, I believe by faith that he died for me and all this other stuff. But where's the repentance? Where's the changed life? Acts chapter 20, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So repentance toward God and faith there toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Two things, one event. All right? Realizing that you've sinned before God and that now I put my faith in Jesus Christ. You know, and, and like I said, I've talk, talked about this in another study too, but I had one of these dumb bunnies, one of these easy believism heretics come to me the one time and he said, you're lost because you preach repentance. You preach that there has to be a changed life. So you're teaching work salvation, therefore you're lost. I said, okay, what must I do to be saved? And he said, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. I said, I do. I do believe that Jesus died for my sins. And he said, yes, but you have to stop teaching repentance. And I said, um, wouldn't that be works then? I have to believe in Jesus and stop preaching repentance to be saved. I have to repent of teaching repentance. These guys just don't think about stuff like that. Acts chapter 26, verse 20. 
head on over there. Acts chapter 26, verse 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Oh, works. Oh, no. Oh, well, what's the context there? What's, what's it talking about? Okay, first of all, we know that it's not talking about some kind of a national repentance to turn away God's judgment and wrath coming upon the nation. No, no, this is individual salvation here. You know, what's he doing? He's going out there and he's preaching the gospel to these different people. He's going on missionary journeys, essentially. There showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, all right, and do works meet for repentance. See, if I come along and I say, you know, God forgive me, I'm a sinner. I've had trouble with pornography all through the years and everything else, and I just, and then it comes out, you know, 20 years later, I'm making adult films or something like this. Did I really repent? Did I really do, am I really doing works meet for repentance? You say, you know, uh, boy, before I got saved, I sure was an alcoholic. Oh, excuse me. Here, I got to get this bottle in here. I'm just going to start drinking. You say, well, that's alcohol. Oh, yeah, well, I, I still drink, you know, and I still get drunk and things like that. But, boy, my life sure has changed since I've been saved. Huh? You know? No, you're to do works meet for repentance. Let him that stole steal no more. You know, the Bible talks about. A lot of people just don't seem to get that. Revelation chapter 16, uh, verse 9. I think we read this one, but we'll just hit it again here. Revelation chapter 16, verse 9. Yeah. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Okay. So you see that. We did read that already. But... Um, and then she has written here next, it has to show a changed life, the fruits of repentance. Okay, Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. It says here, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. Okay, um, I had planted an apple orchard earlier this year, so um, here's some potatoes. So, uh, huh? Um, I thought you said you planted an apple orchard. What are you giving me potatoes for? See, that, that wouldn't be the right kind of fruits, you know? Um, I got saved, God saved me, and... Uh, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm on my way to heaven. Okay, what are the fruits? Well, you know, I still get drunk occasionally and I still, you know, fornicate once in a while and cheat on my wife, you know, and things like that. And uh, I beat my children up and things and uh, I um, steal and, and uh, I've robbed a couple banks and, and uh, shot a couple people that, you know, I haven't been caught for it yet. But I'm a Christian. Uh, no, those aren't the fruits of a Christian. A tree is known by their fruit, you see. So that's what's going on there. Yes, there is, there must be a changed life afterwards. I'll give you a little example, okay? Um, if you know about the ministry here, I am originally from Pennsylvania, okay? And my wife and I were living in Pennsylvania, and she's from Iowa originally. You can see her testimony testimony, watch that, you can hear her story, but we were living in Pennsylvania. Now in January of this year, 2014, we moved to the state of Maine, okay? Now, first of all, I want to make a point here. When people, you know, I'd go to stores, local stores and things like that, and I'd say, I need boxes. They'd say, why? And I said, well, because I'm Packing, organizing, loading, 
uh, calling, uh, canceling. Um, no, I didn't say it. I, I didn't tell him every detail of the move. I just simply said, I'm moving. We're moving. My wife and I are moving. You see? And so that's point number one. What I'm saying with that is, by the way, you know, when you get saved, there's a lot of things that happen there at your salvation, but you're not saying, I, okay, um, I uh, admitted to being a sinner, I repented of my sins, I believed, I had faith, I had a changed life, I did, no, 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 there's a lot about being saved that goes into that package, but it's just, you say, I'm, I got saved, okay? So that's one point I want to make, but secondly, how would it be if I told all of you out there, I and my, myself and my wife, we m are moving to the state of Maine. But you looked and you saw the background behind me there, the old background when I was down in Pennsylvania, and looked the same. It was the same place. You say, well, I thought you were moving. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, well, I, you know, I'm moving. See, it looks like you're still in Pennsylvania. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, but, you know, uh, we moved, we moved, but you said to the state of Maine, see, it's kind of like a lot of, of professing Christians out there, they say, I'm a Christian, well, did you move? Well, no, not technically, I mean, you know, I still pretty much, you know, live the same kind of life I had before I got saved, but I'm a Christian, uh, no, you're, you're not, you don't have any fruits there, you, you didn't, don't have any works there to show that you moved, that you changed, that your life has changed, that you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. See? And that's so dangerous. I mean, I just, I can't get that through enough. You know, that there are so many people out there that are falsely converted. They've prayed some prayer, especially childhood conversions are really, really bad. Because you get a little child, their mind doesn't even understand. They don't even understand all the implications of, of true biblical salvation. And they think to themselves, I'm a Christian because I prayed some little prayer. You know, man, it's really, really a bad thing. But, you know, I mean, I hear these people, you know, you see them and they don't believe the King James Bible and they, they hate the old hymns and they're like, there's just no spiritual fellowship there when you talk to them. It's like you're talking to somebody that's lost. And you say, uh, when did you get saved? I got saved when I was two years old. You didn't get saved when you were two years old. I'm sorry. I don't think so. All right. Um, Luke chapter 3, verse 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 3, verse 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So again there, you're, he's talking to these Jews, and they're saying, hey, We're the you know, children of Abraham, we're the descendants of Abraham, so we're automatically saved. And the Lord's saying, If you were saved, you wouldn't be doing this stuff that you're doing. You know, that's what he's saying there. And again, there has to be a change. Acts chapter 26, verse 20, we already looked at that. It's about doing works meet for repentance. Okay. And she has written here, God and Jesus, or through Jesus, I'm not clear of this verse, if Jesus also gives forgiveness of sins, or God through Jesus is the one who forgives. Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man. So what Jesus Christ did on the cross is what pays for our sins. Now you say, well, then Jesus isn't God. Well, of course Jesus is God. But positionally, you know, you have the Godhead there. One third of the Godhead is what died on the cross. Okay, and you know, the mystery of godliness is great. You know, you start thinking about all this stuff and it's like, you kind of start to, you know, man, I don't quite understand all that. <laughs> you're not supposed to. Okay, you're not supposed to understand God. And I mean, our puny little brains down here cannot fathom the creator of the universe. All you can do is just believe what's in the book. All right, but God is in eternity as the soul. The Holy Ghost is the omnipresent spirit of God. And Jesus Christ was what was walking around. He was who was walking around down here on the earth. Okay, the soul that was in him is God. All right, and 
The Spirit is the Holy Ghost. Right? So when he dies on the cross, he gives up the ghost. Father, why have you forsaken me? See? And it's his body, it's the flesh, the body of flesh that died on the cross. All right, so just to clear that up. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Looks like we have two more places to go to here. This verse, another one yet, and then we are done with the study here. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. All right. Now, what you have there, again, I believe we're back to a national repentance. There, uh, the repentance to Israel, because Israel is obviously a nation. And so Israel, you know, here in the early part of, book, of the book of Acts, you're dealing again with this transition time where you have the kingdom still being offered and they're saying, okay, you guys slew your king, you know, by wicked hands you slew your king, will you accept him? And a lot of the Jews are at first, and then it's just like more and more of them are going, away with them, put them in prison, you know, and all everything else. And they're, they're bringing persecution upon those Christians. Okay, so here he's saying, he's being preached that, you know, he's come to give repentance to Israel. They just crucified their king. If they want to accept him now as their king, they're going to need to repent of what they did there. And if they repent of that thing that they did, we have no king but Caesar, you know, crucify him, crucify him. And they go, oh, you know, they're pricked in their conscience and they say, men and brethren, what, 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 what must we do? See, they're repenting, they're turning, they're changing their mind there in the sense of, of individuals, but that nation of Israel is who it's being spoken to. And it leads to forgiveness of sins. Now, what happened with the nation of Israel there? Well, nationally, they still rejected Jesus, even after 500 eyewitnesses saw him come up from the dead. There was all this proof and everything else. The Christians were doing all these mighty works and everything. That was the purpose of the early sign gifts, to confirm the word of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. They still nationally rejected Jesus Christ. And that's why God's judgment is coming upon the, the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be a terrible time for them. That's why I pray and I try to witness to them. So, and last we finally have James chapter 2, verse 19. <clears throat> James 2, uh, verse 19. I'll get there yet. Okay. And she has written here, it cannot be only belief because the devils also believe and tremble, but they do not repent. Very good point. James chapter 2, verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, that thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Do the devils turn, turn from their, their ways and change their lives and things like this? Of course not. So you can have belief and no repentance. Like I said, Jack Hiles is a perfect example. You know, he's up there, he's a preacher of the Word of God, and he puts on a good show and everything else. And in, in the meantime, the guy's messing around and, and, and fornicating, committing adultery with his deacon's wife. And however, many other women, he's having these young college girls come to him and sing, we love you, preacher, and all this other stuff. Inappropriate completely inappropriate and there was all kinds of perversion and stuff issues and things there at Hiles Anderson you know his son David Hiles is fornicating with multiple women you know, taking nude pictures of himself with them you know in the act you know I mean it's insane but you say you go to Dave Hiles he was a pastor when he's doing that a Baptist pastor I'm sure that he professed that he believed in Jesus Christ but you see, the works didn't match a truly repentant life. So that's going to be it for this study. And, uh, you know, there's some other things there, but it's mostly personal stuff. So I'm not going to read the rest of the email here. But, uh, you know, I just, I really wanted to do this thing. And, 
you know, when I got this email, I thought, okay, I could answer her back, but, you know, I want to put this out for the brethren out there because there's been a lot of confusion, a lot of attacks on me because of what I preach about repentance. And I wanted to clarify it. You know, I don't just teach every reference to repentance is all sinners having to, to turn from their sin to be saved. Uh, no, there are a lot of references to God saying, I'm changing my mind about the evil there. There are references to national repentance, national turning from wickedness and idolatry and things to spare God's wrath coming down. But then there's also the individual repentance. The people having a changed mind, a change in their actions, a change in their, in their manner and the, and the life that they have. Okay? And, you know, it just, it sickens me because these, these easy believism people are just, they're making so many problems. You know, and it, it just, it's frustrating because I think that there have been a lot of people out there that have fallen for this easy believism thing and they have never truly come to God as repentant, contrite sinners. And as a result, they're believing that they're saved when they're not. And uh, that truly is tragic. It truly is tragic. And for those of you out there that have truly been born again, you understand that there was a major change in your life. You know, there's the old hymn, you know, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. You know, I mean, I got saved and nothing happened. Huh? You are now connected to the God of the universe. You are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Jesus Christ, you're seated together in heavenly places and nothing happens to you. There's no help to get away from that life of sin that you used to live. You just go on continuing in the same wickedness, the things that the Bible openly condemns, and there's no chastening in your life. It just doesn't work. You know, it does not work. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, and I just want to say this too. To the sister out there that put this thing together, um, you know, I've seen this thing many times, you know, with some of the brethren. They, they put together these studies and they like really, the Lord shows them the scriptures. And it's just like, you know, I want somebody who understands the Bible to confirm that I'm right and what I've written in things. And, you know, I can say from what you've written there, you did fine. The Lord definitely gave you those scriptures and, and you know, you say, well, what, what scriptures would you use? All oh, those ones, you know. Is there are some other ones? Yeah, we could go through some other scriptures and things like that, but it's it's just going to be, you know, kind of redundant, you know, showing the same scriptures and, and the theme of repentance through the Bible. Those are the best verses that I could provide. You know, that if I was to put together those this email myself, I would have given you those verses. So... Um, I apologize to people if I haven't been real crystal clear on the thing of what repentance is, you know, um, that changed uh, mindset that you come to God, you're a sinner, you understand that you're a sinner, and it leads to a change in your direction in life and a changed life consequently when you get saved, you know, that's what repentance is. And if you have somebody that's coming out and saying that, that, uh, you don't need to repent and all these things and, and whatever else. False prophet, get away from them. I really don't waste much time listening to Jack Hiles and some of these other guys. You know, they're not worth my time. So let's clo close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, so much for your word. I thank you for the clarity of uh, looking and searching the scriptures and comparing scripture with scripture. And know that your Holy Spirit can also bear witness, Lord. Um, when we hear other preachers and other teachers and things, and it's just something doesn't sound right. And uh, I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that if there are any people out there that, that have really are unsure of their salvation, that they would not think it's some kind of a attack of Satan to get them to doubt their salvation or something like this, but they would actually just 
just sit down and, and consider that they might not be saved, and that they come to you and pray and, and just simply say, Lord, I don't know for sure. And they get that thing straightened out. Maybe they are saved. Maybe they have truly been saved. But you know, I just pray that you would, if they are saved and just messing around in sin, that they would get those sins confessed and work on forsaking those sins and that your Holy Spirit would help them to get away from those sins. And uh, I just really pray, Lord, I know the hour is so late right now for the body of Christ and, and things are just about done. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would all have the strength to not waste time on frivolous things that just don't matter, but that we would all be busy about your work till you take us out of here. I ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Um, just a little ministry update here. Uh, winter came very early this year <laughs> um, here in northeastern Maine, <clears throat> and it's uh, very cold outside right now, and I think it's supposed to get down to one degree Fahrenheit this tonight and things. So um, this place, uh, you find out more and more that there's more and more work to be done and, and things. So um, very busy trying to get the rest of the Stephen Anderson and his lies videos done and I should have those up Lord willing in the next couple of weeks but they're requiring more than just a little bit of work they're I'm having to do more research um, there are some things coming up here um, some other studies that that the Lord is showing us some very interesting uh, information I don't want to I don't want to ruin the surprise but uh, um, some very interesting studies coming up here. Uh, I am. I had a request to do a sermon on baptism. What is baptism, and things. So I'm going to try to get that done soon here. Uh, I'm not sure of some other subjects yet, but there's there's a bunch of interesting studies come up. So coming up. So please just keep us in your prayers. Um, you know this this time of the year is a very busy time of year because uh, last year we had. Uh, our neighbors taking care of our lane simply because I just didn't have the money to have any kind of a snow removal type of a deal and and um, now I have a, the ability to be able to move snow myself and so that's another thing you know another responsibility and things and here in this part of Maine it's you know depending on how much precipitation you get you know it can be a lot of work so um, <clears throat> just you know finding better ways to heat the home here and everything you know the ministry headquarters where we're at and uh, just just a lot of work so please just keep us in your prayers and um uh i guess that's going to be it so i hope i've cleared up this thing of repentance now what i teach about repentance i hope that you have it more clear in your mind um i i'm not teaching work salvation okay i have put my faith in jesus christ all right, and and it's not my own works that get me saved. It's not your works that get you saved. It is your faith and your belief in what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. But there's also that repentance there, coming to God as a sinner, broken and saying, "Here I am. Please save me." You know, and that joy that comes from that, from having a new life given to you that all that old sins and everything of the old man, it dies and is buried with Jesus Christ, which is what baptism symbolizes, buried and rising again. Okay? That's what baptism is about. That is what the new birth is all about. When you get born again, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, and things will change when you are truly born again. That's the way it is. So that is it. Thank you very much for watching.